Well, good morning. It's great to see you. Yeah, great to be back in the house. I missed you last week. Uh, I was suffering for Jesus in Montana. Yeah, so tough week for me, but, but now it's a yearly trip, and uh, we helped to start a church planning network here in the Atlanta area years ago, and I helped to lead that network. And so every year we take a group of guys from our network to Montana, and we fly fish, and we rest. And I did one of the funnest things I've ever done this year. I went prairie dog hunting. It was incredible. And yeah, my wife thought it was really, really mean. But in essence, we were serving cattle farmers, okay? We're, we're on this 200,000-acre cattle ranch. And these prairie rats, as I now call them, they like to dig holes. And, and the cattle step off in the holes, and they break their legs, and they lay down, and they die. And so that cost these ranchers a lot of money. So we went out and we served them, okay? And like I told my wife, if you're offended that I did that, it's just because I love cows more than prairie rats, okay? So anyway, but glad to be back. And, and as you just heard, we're continuing on in our John series. So if you have a Bible, you can go there now. John chapter 2 is where we're going to be today. But a few weeks ago, I was talking to a friend of mine about a book called Knowledge of the Holy, written by A.W. Tozer if you have never read that book, I would encourage you, grab a copy. It's a pretty short read, but it's, it's, it's well worth your time. But Tozer, he opens up the book with this statement. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And as Christians, we believe Jesus is God, so we can apply that statement to him. What comes into our minds when we think about Jesus is the most important thing about us. So let me ask, what do you think about him? What do you think about him? When you think of Jesus, what is the picture that pops into your brain? This is my opinion, so you can take it or leave it. You don't have to agree with me. That's fine. But, but I am of the belief that in our culture today, we have emasculated Jesus in many ways. Like a lot of people think of Jesus as some white dude with blonde hair and blue eyes and feathered bangs. You know, he's wearing a tie-dyed shirt, and he's carrying around a little lamb wherever he goes, and and he loves everyone, and he judges no one, which means that you and I get to do whatever we want to do. And I just want to say to you, that is not the Jesus of the Bible. And that is not the Jesus that we have gathered to celebrate today, and our text for today proves it. If you're already there, we're going to pick it up in verse 12 of John 2. Here's what John writes. After this, Jesus went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and he stayed there for a few days. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen, oxen, uh, oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. So we're going to stop and talk for a moment. All right, so John sets the scene. Jesus leaves the village of Cana, where he did his first miracle, changed the water into wine at the wedding. And if you missed that sermon, you can go back and watch it. Our location pastors all did a great job preaching that one last weekend. But Jesus leaves Cana, and he goes to this other town called Capernaum, which basically served as his home base for much of his ministry. And he stays there a few days with his crew, and then he leaves Capernaum, and he goes up to Jerusalem, which is a little confusing if you look at a map because Jerusalem is actually south of Capernaum, but John is speaking topography here, okay? Jerusalem sits about 2,500 feet above sea level, and so it really doesn't matter where you're traveling in from. You are always going up to the city of Jerusalem, and Jesus went there because the Passover was about to start. Okay, if you're not sure about the Passover, this was an annual Jewish celebration, so it happened every year, and it lasted seven days. And millions of Jewish people from all over the Greco-Roman world, they would come to the city of Jerusalem to celebrate. In fact, Jerusalem, its population was normally around a quarter of a million people. During Passover, the city grew to upwards of two million people. This was a very, very big deal. And they came here to celebrate the fact that hundreds of years earlier, God had saved their ancestors out of Egyptian slavery. You can read that story in the book of Exodus but we covered this a few weeks ago when we talked briefly about Exodus 12. After serving as slaves in Egypt for 400 years, God finally decided enough's enough. Right? I'm going to get my people out of there. And so he raised up this deliverer named Moses, and he started sending plagues on the land, all to convince the Pharaoh to let his people go. And the last plague was the plague of the death of the firstborn son. So this angel of death sweeps through the land, kills all the firstborns of the Egyptians, but God made this provision for his people, the nation of Israel. He said, I want every family to take a lamb, 
It has to be male, at least a year old, no spots or defects or blemishes. It has to be perfect in every way. And I want you to kill the lamb and put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of your homes. And so when the angel of death swept through the land, he saw the blood on the doorpost and he passed over those homes, sparing those children from death. And all of that, as we learned a few weeks ago, points us forward to Christ who is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so, in essence, Jesus is showing up to a party here that's all about him, but the people don't realize it's all about him. They're just there to go through the motions of what they've done for centuries now. But part of celebrating Passover meant paying a visit to the temple. And you would go to the temple for a couple reasons. You would go to make sacrifices and offerings to God. And if you were a Jewish male over the age of 20 years old, you would go and pay a temple tax. And this money was, help, was used to help keep up the temple. So here is Jesus going to do what every other Jewish male would do. He, he goes to the temple. And the first thing that he sees are people selling animals. Which, by the way, was not problematic in and of itself. Okay, I, I grew up in church, and I would hear people use this story at times to talk about how it's sinful to sell anything in church. Y'all see what Jesus did? It's, it's evil to sell anything in church. That's not the point of the story, Okay. Um, God actually allowed people to sell animals because when people traveled into the city of Jerusalem for Passover, in many cases, they were traveling very, very long distances, and it was really hard to keep up with the ox or the sheep or the bird when they were on their way. And so in Deuteronomy 14, and you can check me on this to make sure I'm telling you the truth, Deuteronomy 14, 22 through 26, God made this provision. He was talking to his people when they were still wandering around in the wilderness and he says, when I bring you into the land, the land of promise, I want you to bring tithes and offerings to the place where I will make my name dwell. That would be Jerusalem, and ultimately, it would be the temple in Jerusalem. But then God said, if that's too far for you, like if you don't live close to that place, then just bring some money with you. And when you get there, you can buy what you need, sheep, oxen, wine, whatever your heart desires. And so, again, the problem was not that they were selling animals. The problem was with how and where they were selling the animals. Okay, so first, they were selling at inflated prices. They were selling at inflated prices. It's like when you go to the sporting event and you got to pay $10, Coke, uh, $10 for the same Coke that you pay a dollar for at the gas station, right? So you, you just better be magic Coke, and it's not. It's just the same Coke. It's frustrating, isn't it? Or they're selling the same T-shirt that you can buy at Walmart for 20 bucks for 50 bucks. Had this conversation with my daughter earlier in the year at a Rome Braves game. We went into the little shop, and she's like, Daddy, I want the shirt. And I looked at the price, and I'm like, we're going to Target. Like, we ain't paying this. And this is what was happening in the temple. In addition to that, many people who brought their own animals for sacrifice were also being forced by the leaders to buy the temple animals. Because when you brought yours in, it had to be inspected. It had to meet certain standards. And so in many cases, the leaders would check the animals and say, oh my gosh, we found a problem. Yours is not fit for sacrifice. You're gonna need to buy one of ours. And again, they were profiting in this way. Secondly, they were selling these animals in what was known as the court of the Gentiles. So if you look at a diagram of the Jerusalem temple, you'll see some different courts or places. At the center are the holy places, and only the priests and the high priests could go into those places. And then you had the inner court, you had the outer court, and then you had the court of the Gentiles, which was the only area of the temple that a Gentile could enter. Okay, do we have any Gentiles in the house today? And if you're like, what is a Gentile? That means you're not Jewish, okay? So any Gentiles? Probably most of us, okay? And so if you were alive at this time, that's the only part of the temple that you could go into, the court of the Gentiles. And it existed because God said through the prophet Isaiah all the way back in Isaiah 56, 7, that his house would be a house for all nations. All nations. Not just the nation of Israel. Israel was obviously God's chosen nation, meant to be a light to all the other nations of the earth. But the temple existed for all nations. What should have been happening then in the court of the Gentiles is service, missionary activity, evangelism. There should have been Jewish people out there loving on the non-Jewish people, but it wasn't happening because the temple leaders had hijacked that space and turned it into a marketplace. Finally, there were the money changers. Because you couldn't buy temple animals or pay your temple tax with your money. You needed temple money to do that. 
And so when you walked in with your money, you would have to go and see the money changer and exchange your money for temple money. And of course, there was a fee you had to pay to exchange it, a lot like when you travel internationally and you need money that is not American money and you gotta go trade it out and, and you gotta pay for that. All that to say, these religious leaders had monetized this provision made by God. So here are these people coming to the city to worship God, meet with God, make sacrifices to God, offerings to him, and these leaders were profiting off of their obedience. I mean, this would be like you showing up to church today, and we got guys out there at the entrance of the parking lot charging you 10 bucks a park. And you come in, and, and our host team's like, hey, where would you like to sit? We got seats in the front going for 50, and seats in the back for 25, and then if you want to sit in the balcony, $10, man, we'll get you up there, right? And or, hey, if you want to take communion before you leave, no problem. Just leave a dollar on the table and, and prayer. We got you. Just slip a five spot to the prayer team member, and we would love to pray for whatever need you might have. This is what was happening in Jesus' day. And I want you to see how he responds. Verse 15. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Don't make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Now, just one quick note on this, and I won't take too much time here, but I think it's important. When you read the Gospels, you actually find two accounts of Jesus cleansing the temple in this way. John places his account at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and the other Gospel writers place it at the end of his ministry. And a lot of scholars think it's the same account. Uh, Other Bible scholars believe it's a different account. These are different. I tend to think they're different. I I tend to think this happened twice, and here's why. Because when you read John's account, Jesus goes in and he cleanses the temple, and the leaders get a bit curious about him. Like, we're going to see that when we get to chapter 3, and here comes Nicodemus wanting to have a conversation with Jesus about the kingdom of God and what it means to be born again But then when you read the later accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, after he cleanses the temple, they kill him. Nobody's curious at that point. They just arrest him and falsely accuse him, and they crucify him. So I believe these are different accounts. But either way, this is a very different picture of Jesus than is often painted. Did anybody see any feathered bangs in what we just read? Anybody notice a tie-dye shirt or a little lamb in his arms? No, this is Jesus angry. This is what it looks like when God gets angry. And he's so angry that he makes a whip. I mean, come on, y'all. How mad do you have to be to make your own whip? You ever been in a situation like that where you're so mad and you're like, I got something to do, and you step outside and you're just like, (laughs) right? And Jesus brings his homemade whip back in the building, and he starts driving out people and driving out animals, pouring out money, turning over tables. And I love this. He singles out the men selling pigeons. Okay, some of your Bibles say it was doves, but the point is it was birds. Here's why that matters. Birds were the sacrifice of choice for poor people. So if you couldn't afford to bring a sheep, if you couldn't afford to bring an ox, you would bring a bird. And the bird would be your offering to the Lord. And so imagine the poor widow who travels in miles and miles to Jerusalem for Passover. And she brings her bird with her. And she gets there to the temple and she hands it to the temple leaders. And he inspects the bird. And he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. This one little feather's out of place. You can't use this. It's not fit for sacrifice. Um, You're going to need to buy one of ours. And so go over to the table and exchange what little money you have for our money. And yeah, you got to pay a fee to do that. And then you're going to need to buy one of our birds, which is marked up in price. And it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. Jesus looks at those men and he says, get the birds out. And stop making my father's house a house of trade. And here are the disciples in the background. They're seeing all this. And if you were a disciple of Jesus at the time, what would you be thinking in this moment? My man, right, that is my dude, I'm with him. And they remember as they're watching him wreck the place, Psalm 69.9, zeal for your house will consume me. Like here was what, what the psalmist was saying about Jesus. The word zeal there, it means passion or jealousy. And he was saying that when Jesus showed up, he would come consumed with jealousy for his father's house. He would be passionate about the temple, the house of God, serving its very purpose. And so when he walked in and he saw that wasn't happening, all that passion and all that jealousy came out of him in the form of anger. 
Like he was angry that God was being dishonored in his own house. He was angry that people on the inside were keeping people on the outside on the outside. He was angry, listen, he was angry that poor, powerless people were being oppressed and marginalized and exploited at the hands of those who were in positions of power and authority. And here's the question I wanna pose to us today. Do those things make you angry? Those things make you angry. Does it anger you when God does not receive the honor and glory he rightfully deserves? Does it, does it anger you when you see people who are far from God being kept from God by people who claim to know God? And does it anger you when image bearers created and loved by God, these are people he came to save, does it anger you when you see people unjustly suffering at the hands of other people, especially those in positions of power? Does that make you angry? Because it should. Like it should infuriate us as followers of Jesus Christ because it infuriated him. And if we want to be like him as his people, that means we get angry at the very things he was angry with. Let me just stop and share my heart for a few moments if I can. I want you to know this is why we do much of what we do here at Cross Point City Church. Okay, we have a a simple mission and we talk about it all the time. We exist to relentlessly pursue those far from God to help them know and follow Jesus. And that mission is deeply personal for me, deeply personal. A lot of you know that I grew up in church, church kid, and I had a lot of great experiences growing up in church, but I also had some really bad experiences growing up in church. Anybody have some bad church experiences growing up? Okay, a lot of us. Like I can remember, for example, as a teenager, I was a part of this growing, thriving student ministry in this little Southern Baptist church that my family attended at the time. And at one point, this group of kids started showing up And they weren't the best kids. Everybody just called them the skater kids. And they would show up and they would cause problems and they would wreak havoc. But praise God, over time, they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and many of them had their lives changed by him. But here's the problem. Um, The deacons in the church didn't like the fact that those kids were showing up. And so at one point, they pulled aside our student pastor and they confronted him about those kids and the problems that all those kids were causing. And I just remember when I heard about that, it made me so angry. In that same season, I remember being on a church bus, one of those charter buses, and we were getting ready to go to the beach for student camp, and I was sitting right next to my best friend at the time. We played music together for many years, and he wore earrings, And I will never forget one of the pastors of our church coming onto that bus and pulling my friend off of that bus in full view of everyone. And he told my best friend, you can't go to student camp unless you take your earrings out. And it made me so angry. I remember a few years later, um, my kid brother, I got a younger brother, his name is John, he was taking up offering in our church. And he was a little punk rock kid at the time, you know, wore tight jeans, had long hair, band t-shirts, he was that kid. Uh, But he loved Jesus And he was following Jesus. And so there he was serving, collecting offering in the church. And after that worship gathering, there was a woman who came up to one of the pastors there. And she used a very derogatory term for my brother that I do not feel comfortable repeating in a setting like this. But her question was, how could you let a kid who's dressed like that collect offering in this church? And instead of that pastor who knew my brother very well defending him and rebuking her, he pulled my brother aside and said, hey, man, you might want to rethink how you're dressing when you come to church in the future. Made me so angry. This is why years ago when we started Cross Point City Church, we started this church to be a church for all people. All people. Not not some people, but all people. Not just people who were already on the inside, but people who were on the outside. People who need to hear about the hope that Jesus Christ has for them. This is why we don't have assigned parking spaces. It's why we don't have assigned seats. Like, if you ever come in on a Sunday and go, hey, that's my seat. I'm just telling you, you're in the wrong church, man. And if anybody ever says to you, that's my seat, you just smile and say, I'm not moving. James says we don't do assigned seats. And you just blame it on me, okay? This is why we don't have silly dress coats. I mean, man, I got elders showing up in shorts and flip-flops every single week, right? I mean, I got one guy, he's from Florida. I can't get him to put shoes on, but that's just who he is. And 
But listen, the gospel is offensive enough, and so we don't ever want to be the people putting up unnecessary barriers that make it hard on people to believe. Amen? Amen. This is why we do what we do. In addition, this is why we drill water wells all over the world. This is why we sponsor children through Food for the Hungry and Compassion International. This is why we work with girls who are being rescued out of sex trafficking. This is why we partner with organizations like Good Neighbor Homeless Shelter, Live 2540, Bartow Family Resources. We do all of this work because there are things in our world that make us angry. Like it angers us that there are kids today who are dying from no water and no food. And it's not because those things aren't available. It's because there are people in positions of power who are corrupt and are preventing those people from getting what they need. It angers us that there are girls being stolen and trafficked and passed around, being used by perverted men as sexual objects. It angers us that there are people in our community who don't have beds, women who don't have the resources they need to birth and care for their babies. And I just want to ask the question again, do those things make you angry? And listen, I know, I know in a setting like this, it's really easy to go, well, of course they make me angry, of course. But here's the real question, and I don't say this to shame you or to condemn you. I'm just trying to nudge you a little bit in love today, so I hope you receive this question in that way. Here's the question. What are you doing about it? Like, what are you doing about it? Because when you're truly angry about something, that anger should lead to action. And I'm just talking about you post about it on social media. Like, we're really good at that. I just want to let everybody know how angry I am. Okay, great. What are you doing to help? See, when you're truly angry, what you do is you start making some whips. You start turning over some tables. And you start confronting corrupt people and corrupt systems. And you start serving people who are on the outside in love. And you do whatever it takes to get them on the inside. Why? Because it is what Jesus did. And if we want to be like him, we have to get angry at the very things he got angry with, which should lead to action. And I want you to see where his action led. So go back to the text, verse 18. Verse 18. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jews then said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you'll raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. And so he gets angry, he wrecks the place, and the leaders ask him, we need a sign. Give us a sign. And what they really wanted to know is what gives you the right to do what you just did. Like, where does your authority to do that come from And I am just curious, have you ever asked God for a sign like this? Have you ever? Like, God, would you just please put the cloud in the sky in the shape of a cross so that I know? You ever done that? Let the song that I love come on the radio at this exact time so that I know. Have you ever done this? Me too. Me too. Okay. And so I'm preaching to all of us. Okay, when we ask God for signs like this, do you know what it reveals in us? A lack of faith. Because ultimately, what we're saying to God is this. In order for me to trust you, to obey you, to believe you, you first need to prove yourself to me. And I just want you to know, because I love you, God refuses to play those silly games with us. God refuses to be tamed by us in that way. And we see that truth in this moment. Jesus says, you want a sign? I'll give you a sign. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up. Now, it's clear from the text, these leaders thought he was talking about the actual temple, the building in which they were standing, which had a very long history. The first temple in Jerusalem was built in the mid-900 B.C.s by a guy named Solomon. He was the son of King David. That same temple was destroyed in 586 B.C. by the Babylonians when they came into Judah and they wrecked the city, tore down the temple, tore down the walls, A remnant of people about 70 years later came back to Jerusalem from Babylon, started to rebuild a version of the temple. But the temple that existed during Jesus' day, this was constructed by Herod the Great. And as we just read, at this point, it was under construction for some 46 years, and it wasn't even finished yet. Like, they wouldn't finish this project until the year 63 AD. Hence the question, come on, bro, really? 
We've been working on this for 46 years, and you're saying if we tear this down, you're just going to rebuild it all in three days. Really? And then John gives us the clarity that we need. He says Jesus was talking about the temple of his body. So in other words, he was speaking about his death and his resurrection. He was saying to these leaders, destroy this body, this temple, this this thing that I'm walking around in. And if you destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. And that is exactly what he did. At the end of his perfect life, these same religious leaders would arrest him, falsely accuse him, try him, and crucify him. And he went willingly, by the way. I mean, Jesus says in the Gospels, no man takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Jesus went for us instead of us. Died the death we deserve in our place for our sins so we could be forgiven and restored back to God. But he went, and then three days later, what did he do? He raised that temple up again. Resurrected from the dead to conquer death and hell for all who would believe. And I love what John tells us. When that happened, the disciples remembered, oh yeah, he told us about this. Oh oh, yeah, I remember. He said he was going to do this, and they believed the scriptures about him. We see this clearly in Acts chapter 2, where on the day of Pentecost, after God pours out the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Peter stands up and preaches the gospel, and as part of his gospel presentation, he quotes Psalm 1610, that God would not let his Holy One see corruption. That is an Old Testament prophecy about the future resurrection of Jesus Christ, and so here are the disciples going, we believe that. And here's the point I want you to take from all this. Jesus Christ is the true temple. Jesus is the true temple. So he didn't come 2,000 years ago just to cleanse a building. He came to tear down the very temple system that these leaders were leveraging to profit off the people. This is why, my friends, the temple in Jerusalem no longer exists, never to be rebuilt again. Uh, It was destroyed by the Romans in the year 70 AD. They came in, decimated the city, tore this majestic building to the crown, and when they did it, sacrificial system went away. No more sacrifices. The priesthood in Jerusalem went away. No more yearly visits to the city, to the temple to celebrate Passover. It all went away. Why? Because Jesus Christ made one sacrifice to end all sacrifices. Praise God. He died once for all sin, and so we don't need to make any other sacrifices to God. The work is done. Secondly, after his resurrection, Jesus ascended and he took his seat on the throne of heaven in his resurrected, glorified body, and he now serves as our high priest. Like he's there praying for us, defending us, representing us to God the Father. And so if you need to go to God, you don't have to go through a human person, you just go through Jesus. You need to confess your sin, go through Jesus. You need to talk to God about something? Go through Jesus. Do you need help to get through something difficult you're facing right now? Go through Jesus. He's there to serve you in that way. And then finally, this is such good news. As the people of God, we no longer have to take pilgrimages across the world to some foreign city, to some building that is standing where the presence of God dwells. But we can access the presence of God anytime, anywhere, because Jesus has opened the way for us. You see, as he was there, hanging on that cross, paying for our sins, this curtain that was in the temple, dividing the holy places, or the holy place from the most holy place, it it cut off the presence of God from the people of God. As Christ was dying for our sins, God himself reached down and he tore that curtain into from top to bottom to let sinners like you and me know that we were now invited in. How good is that? But it doesn't stop there, okay? It's not just that his presence is available to us, but his presence also now lives in us. 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 6, 19, the apostle Paul says there that your body, if you know Jesus, is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So his presence used to reside there in Jerusalem, and now his presence, if you know him, it resides in you. Why? Because Jesus bought you. And he bought you at a price, which is his own blood, his own life. Like he paid for you. You belong to him. And so the charge in 1 Corinthians 6 19 is, so glorify God in your body. That's a very different message than we hear from our world today, isn't it? I mean, our world tells us all the time, no, 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 you do what you want with your body. 
Your body's your body. You can use your body any way you want to use your body. Um, our own flesh tells us that. Uh, there's this broken part of all of us that has yet to be redeemed. One day in eternity it will be gone, praise God. But right now we struggle with it. We wrestle against it each and every day. And our own flesh tells us this. Do what you want with your body. The devil tells us this, obviously. But Jesus goes, you can't do what you want with your body because it's not yours, it's mine. I gave up my body to lay claim to your body, and so the goal is to use your body for the very glory of God. And the way you do that, Romans 12, 1, is by offering your body to God each and every day as a living sacrifice. That is your spiritual act of worship, Paul says. You don't bring animals, you don't bring stuff, you bring you. And you lay yourself down before the God who created you and you offer yourself to him in service for his glory and the good of other people. And you do it, catch this, you do it all in response to the offering Jesus Christ made on your behalf. So in other words, your motivation for offering you matters. Your motivation for offering you it matters, and this is what I want us to see from the last portion of the text that we're going to read today. This is where we'll start to close. Verse 23. Now, when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when he saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. So John says that while Jesus was there in the city, Apparently, he did a lot of other signs, a lot of other miracles. John didn't write them down for us. But what he tells us is that there were people who saw those things, and many of them believed. Now, I'm going to keep bringing this up all throughout the series. The word believe there in the Greek is pastuo. It is a verb. It is an action word, and it means to entrust. And it is the same word that John uses when he says that Jesus didn't entrust, pastuo. So this is really interesting. He says here that these people, when they saw the signs, they entrusted themselves to Jesus, but Jesus did not entrust himself to them because he knew what was in them. See, he, he knew their motivation for offering himself to them. He knew what was underneath that, if you will. And ultimately what he saw was that their faith was in a sign, not in him as their savior. See, I need you to catch this, man. Signs don't save people. And miracles don't save people. Jesus saves people. And when you put your faith in anything outside of Jesus, that is called artificial faith. A lot of y'all know I like the fish. 99% of the time I'm using artificial baits. These are baits that look real, but they're not real. Artificial baits like that. It's faith that looks real, but it's not real. This is faith that cannot save you. I need you to catch this today. Salvation is a two-way street. So it's not just about you receiving Jesus, it's also about Jesus receiving you. It's not only about you entrusting yourself to Jesus, it is about Jesus entrusting himself to you. And Jesus receives you and he entrusts himself to you when you put your faith in him. Not in something outside of him, not even in something that he can do. You put your faith in him and you do it all in recognition of your spiritual need. You see, there's got to come a point for you where you finally admit about yourself that you are a sinner who needs a Savior. That you have offended the holy God who created you. That he put you on planet earth to honor him, to glorify him, to represent him, and you have blown that. And because you've blown it, you are now dead in your sins and trespasses. Under the wrath and judgment of God, helpless and hopeless in every way. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't work your way out of that. You can't earn your way into favor with God. And then you believe that Jesus can, that He can do all that for you, and that He did. That when He came, He lived the life you could not live, a life of sinless perfection. That he died the death you deserved in your place for your sins so that you could be accepted and loved by the God who created you. But you don't stop there at Savior. You then confess him as Lord. You don't make him Lord. You confess him as Lord. He's Lord whether you like it or not. Okay? And so this is you recognizing what is true about him. He rose from the dead, conquering death, hell, and the grave. He is alive, ruling and reigning over all things, worthy of your allegiance and devotion. And so you hand the reins of your life over to him. 
King Jesus, it ain't about me anymore. It's about you and your glory. And here's what's incredible. When you entrust yourself in faith to Jesus in that way, he entrusts himself to you despite knowing everything about you. Come on, how good is this? John says it. And he knows what's in man. He knows. He knows what's in you. He knows how jacked up you are. (laughs) He knows how broken you are. He knows those sinful desires that live in your heart. He knows all the warped thoughts that cross your mind each and every day. Yet at the cross, he gave his life for you, and he still offers to give himself to you today, which is what makes the love of God so amazing. And it demands a response. It demands a response. The gospel of Jesus Christ always demands a response. And we want to take time and respond like we always do. So let me just tell you what's going to happen, okay? Uh, The band's going to come out. We're going to sing together like always. Love to sing around here. And we're going to sing this song called Tremble, which talks about darkness trembling at the name of Jesus. Fear being silenced at the name of Jesus. We saw that today in the text, didn't we? Like Jesus walks in and darkness just starts falling. Fear starts shutting its mouth. And so we want to sing this song like saved people, and we want to recognize what is true about our Savior and Lord. And then I want to invite us to pray. I want to invite us to pray specifically that the Holy Spirit of God would empower us to live lives here upon the earth that pushes back the darkness. Like, come on, y'all know as followers of Jesus, we're here to do what Jesus did. We're here to represent God to a lost and dying world, to light up dark places, to offer hope to people who need hope. That's why we're here. And some of you, you're angry about all the right things, but you're doing nothing, and so you might need to pray for courage. God, give me courage to act. Give me courage to finally get involved in the ministry. Give me courage to stop spending all my stinking money on stuff that doesn't matter and to invest in ministry that is changing lives. You might just need to pray and ask God to give you courage today. As always, the front of this room is going to be open. Come get on your knees in the presence of God and do business with him. That's what you need to do. If you want to eat, drink, we have communion elements available. That's, that's for you if you want to remember what Christ has done. And then I would just remind you, in these moments, we, we always invite you to give because we believe giving is a response. It's not a duty. It's not an obligation. It's something we do in response to what God's given to us. And so every bit of what you give here at Crosspoint, we use it to fund ministry that pushes back darkness. So if you came ready to give today, you can do that. And then some of you just need to give him your lives. Admit you're a sinner. Believe Jesus Christ as your Savior. And confess him as Lord and just give your life to him. So let me pray. And we're going to ask God to come and move. Father, thank you for your word. And we thank you for Jesus. And, And I thank you, God, that in a passage like the one we studied we see your heart so clearly. We see your heart toward sin. (laughs) We see your heart toward corruption. We see your heart toward sinners and corrupt people. God, we, we see your heart to bring people who are on the outside on the inside, to make them sons and daughters in your family. And we just thank you that Jesus shows us that. And so, God, over the next several moments as we sing and pray and give and take communion, whatever we're going to do, God, we just pray you'd show up in a powerful way. That you would do things in our hearts and in our lives that can only be explained by you. God, for those of us that are angry about the right things, give us courage to do something about it. To step out into the world and to act in a way that glorifies you and helps people. So, God, whatever you need to do today to make us more like Jesus, that is the ask. God, come and have your way. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.